I welcome you to my home. Do come in, have a seat. I have something here to relax you. I think you find it quite a treat. If you find me sounding insane, it's just the absolute talking. It's just the absolute Welcome back to another episode of It At. Welcome back to the parlor. So um, in uh, in this episode, we're going to, uh, not yet, <laughs> we'll wait uh, till we actually get into the uh, speculation part, but we will be uh, uh, pulling the uh, cover off of the crystal ball and kind of making a few predictions here as we, uh, as we move on with the video. But let's start off with some of the things that we already know. So... As folks that are familiar with this channel are aware, the content here is driven by the comment section. And so in the comment section, what I've been seeing lately is a lot of folks that are wondering, well, where is Tesla at with their batteries? What, you know, we haven't heard anything in a while. And so uh, as far as the chemistry goes, there really isn't that much more to tell. They have their secret sauce uh, for what they were describing as their million mile battery. They've settled on a, uh, uh, on a composition where they're using very little cobalt to no cobalt, high nickel. They're using uh, uh, quartz silicon based uh, 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 composition, based chemistry in the, uh, in the battery. Now what they've done is they have set that chemistry out to bid. And so what they've done is they've already approved or recently approved, I saw that yesterday, where uh, they've approved CATL as a manufacturer. They've got uh, contracts out to Panasonic. What these other manufacturers are doing now is they're sending examples of their batteries to Tesla to test and to then wind up confirming that they meet Tesla's specifications for the batteries for their vehicles. And all of the manufacturers that meet those specifications, their batteries are going into Tesla products. Now, the Tesla products that are currently on the market are likely already using, I'm sure they're already using this chemistry. That's why their batteries are already lasting as long as they do. But there are huge advantages to be gleaned now from the tablet's architecture and the size of the new battery, the new larger battery. So there's a lot made of the Plaid Plus being canceled. The Plaid Plus was not canceled. The Plaid Plus was put on hold primarily for marketing reasons, uh, but also I'm sure for some engineering reasons. They probably weren't quite ready with the structural pack just yet. There was probably still some, some bugs that they needed to, uh, to work out of that. They likely were also not ready to ramp up production to meet the numbers of, of people who wanted that vehicle. Uh, they likely also saw that there were a high number of reserves for the Plaid Plus, that people were waiting on that version of the Model S rather than getting the Plaid version. And the difference between the Plaid Plus and the Plaid is basically the range of it. Now, I don't know that they're going to be gleaning too much more than what they've gotten already off of the Plaid version as far as its ability to um, continue to do regenerative braking or multiple launches. Uh, they put a much larger heat exchanger on the, uh, on the car, much larger radiator to deal with things like running it around a track. Um, and, and also that helps with, you know, with daily use of the, uh, of the vehicle. But they are not yet fully able to take advantage of the high-speed charging or the high-speed uh, um, BMS battery balancing that's going to be able to take place using this tablet, this new tablet architecture. And they're not yet able to take advantage of the range of the increased energy density of these new batteries for probably... Again, we'll maybe speculate, pull that, pull it off, and, and give a, a time. But uh, uh, you know, I'll go out on a limb and I'll say that they're going to be doing that probably in another 
year or so, you'll start seeing the Plaid Plus all of a sudden reemerge from, from its ashes. So this is all, again, based on their ability to have cells to put in these vehicles. And their number one priority at this point is Cybertruck. Possibly also batteries for um, home batteries. I think that that's also, I believe, a high priority. I think that there's somebody at Tesla that ha is intelligent enough to have linked the two. You can view the Energy Sovereignty Project and see obviously why the two are very intertwined. If we start seeing vehicles coming out in the numbers that I think that they're going to come out, then there's going to have to be a balance with that of people that also adopt solar power and batteries for their home so that they can actually then offset that additional load that's going to be on the system. We've talked before about uh, people arguing, oh, well, you know, the, the, if everybody started driving an EV tomorrow that it would crash the grid. Well, that's true. If they started driving it tomorrow, it would, but they can't start driving it tomorrow. There has to be a curve of adoption. And my argument has been and is still that that curve of adoption is going to more or less be mimicked by people at the home that are also seeking at least some level of energy sovereignty. And so it's not going to be the, the load on the grid that, that anybody predicts. It's one of those things that's likely going to be a self-solving problem, especially since the Cybertruck costs half of what the Model S does, and it has, well, currently, it's got twice the range of, uh, nearly twice the range of, uh, of a Model S. And I think that that will also go up as they start to experiment a little more with these new battery packs and whatnot. We'll speculate on that a little bit uh, later. So the uh, important takeaway on all of this is, as far as the batteries go, is that these companies are now bidding on who gets to supply batteries to Tesla. So that's a hugely lucrative contract. Everybody knows it. And once they are able to do that, and they're already making those new large cell, large uh, um, uh, format batteries, they're going to start putting those out for other companies to purchase, probably not with the same chemistry that Tesla is using, because like I said, that's Tesla's secret sauce. These companies are going to be under contract to supply Tesla with their proprietary chemistry for a specific period of time. But what that does is it does put these other manufacturers on notice as far as how long a Tesla battery lasts as opposed to something sold for another product, say like iRobot in your Roomba. Uh, or w whatever. I mean, there's going to be countless products that are going to start using these new batteries. Well, unlike the light bulb, I don't know how many are aware of the, that whole light bulb saga, but um, there's actually a cabal of companies that decides how long a light bulb can burn for. And that's sickening to me that, that, that we've had to deal with that and now that's kind of an open secret. But I'm hoping that because Tesla is really out to promote the adoption of renewable energy, that they have really kind of yanked the rug out from under that whole idea of planned obsolescence. They seem to have that's already become evident in their electric vehicles and the way that they're setting up their dealerships. It's not, it doesn't seem to be set up for this whole Thing, this whole idea of, of the service center, uh, the, the vehicles do seem to be set up to be more or less as near as can be achieved, maintenance free. They are certainly very low maintenance, I, I, I will attest to that. But that puts these other battery manufacturers on notice. If somebody at Roomba or at Robot is going to wind up buying, robot, uh, buying batteries for their uh, for the robots, then they're going to say, well, does yours last as long as the Tesla battery? And Tesla maybe will do well if they can keep up with the demand for their vehicles to actually also offer their batteries to other companies that want to use a battery that has that amount of longevity. Uh, so that helps to solve the recycle problem. Well, buy an old Roomba, pull the battery out, and, you know, 
if you're in a salvage yard or whatever, you can resell that component now to people who want to do whatever for it, make electric skateboards or electric bicycles or whatever winds up being the, the second life for that incredibly long-lived battery. And then even at the end of its life, now Tesla is also again talking about the recycling of that, reclaiming all of that battery. They want it back. And other companies will do well to copy that model. I would love it to see other automotive manufacturers also follow that model. I think that that would, uh, that would serve them and us incredibly well. So with all of that said, let's do a little speculation. Let's look into the crystal ball and uh, talk a little bit about what, uh, what I see as the future of all of this. Well, it starts with that Tesla Gigafactory in Texas. So they're kind of running numbers around of, you know, 300,000, half a million cyber trucks a year. I, I, I'm thinking by what I know about the, the scale of things and what I've kind of seen with the, with the cyber truck, I think they're really lowballing that. I think that we're going to wind up seeing within a year or two that Tesla is going to be producing a million cyber trucks a year. The vehicle is simply not that complex. It's technologically complex, but they've already got factories that can bang out the motors and other aspects of the hardware. They've got a stamping machine that can stamp out the entirety of the center section, uh, the load bearing section of the, uh, of the Cybertruck. So when they start to produce that thing, then we'll actually be able to kind of get an idea of what the overall numbers are. Uh, and again, they're gonna base a lot of their expansion on does this vehicle gain traction? They've got a million pre-orders, but at $100 a refundable pop, that really doesn't mean a whole lot. Uh, but it is interesting when you start men when you start to compare that as an apples to apples comparison against the Ford Mach E, the uh, Aptera. We we'll talk about that in a, in a different uh, video. But when you start to look at the same type of refundable reservation for other vehicles that tends to put the demand into at least a little bit of perspective. I don't, I don't hold it in anywhere near the regard that I do reservations for something like the Model S or Model X, where you actually do have to put down a couple of grand for it. You know, it's not likely that you're going to uh, back out on uh, on that. So, as we start to see what the ramp up is. I think that Tesla is completely capable of producing at first close to a million vehicles a year out of that um, plant that they have in Texas as they expand into it. And then they're going to wind up doing the same thing in Germany. And they're probably going to do the same thing at some point in Asia. And it's the, driven by the fact that Tesla's factories are modular. They're able to be rapidly reproduced elsewhere. And then that saves them the shipping costs and whatnot. And then if you wind up also with the batteries being manufactured locally, then this hugely speeds up their ability to keep up with what is going to be an outrageous demand for a vehicle that, though ugly, is simple to make, easy to maintain, if you're in any kind of a, a, a truck use scenario, it's just going to be a, a fantastic vehicle. I think that people have really underestimated the popularity that this vehicle is going to have. I think I mentioned in another video that if I had seen the Cybertruck with a five to 800 mile range sitting next to my vehicle in the showroom when I purchased mine, I would have bought the Cybertruck because just like I'm into uh, the electric skateboards and, and other things for e-mobility and not sport, I was also equally interested in an electric vehicle for e-mobility and range. My primary concern would have been range, 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 range. How far can I drive it without having to plug it in someplace else. How long can I go and still return to my home? And even if I have a huge battery in the vehicle and it takes me days 
to catch up, to replenish that vehicle, that I can still do so by using the spare power stored from sunlight at my house. And that brings us, interestingly, in a, in a good way to vehicles like the Aptera and the Lightyear. I'm, I'm not trying to, and we'll go into this in a greater detail when I talk about the, the video, when I do the video on those vehicles specifically, but I'm not trying to say that those concepts cannot or will not work as far as the self-charging. But somebody asked me, well, you know, why, you know, why did you, why did you reserve a thousand mile uh, Aptera? Well, I, I did that because of the battery size. That allows me to, if I, on those days when I don't drive 40 miles, I want to do an honest examination of, in the best case scenario for that vehicle, can you keep up? Same thing with the Energy Sovereignty Project home. You've already seen in those shoulder periods during the year, do we keep up? On the cloudy days, we have to use more power than we save, but on sunny days, how long do we make up for that? Same exact thing with uh, the Aptera. That's why the large battery. So I'm not saying that that's going to be a viable alternative. I personally don't think it, it will be. I don't think that that the real world application of a self-charging car will work, but I do think the real world application of, a char of charging your car off of your house will work. And so again, this whole video is about the batteries and about speculation. Well, I don't think that those batteries are just being thought of for the cars. They're gonna be thought of for ever increasingly large home battery solutions. Because like I said, you can't ramp up electric vehicle adoption without also ramping up solar and home batteries. If we all adopted electric vehicles tomorrow, the grid would crash. That's a legitimate argument. Will we all start driving electric tomorrow? Nope, it's going to ramp up. So basically that's where, uh, that's where we're at. The state of where Tesla is as far as their batteries are is currently that they have the chemistry for the battery. They have the architecture for the battery. Now they actually need the battery for the battery. And so they have put this out to bid for other companies and we'll watch them closely. I'm especially interested in Panasonic. I think Panasonic is going to wind up being a, uh, a major contributor to them, but I'm also watching some others that I've purposely not named yet uh, because I think that they, they are going to surprise us. I think that um, or have the potential to surprise us. Let's, let's say that. And so I'll save that for another video where I start to name names about some of the um, other contenders for battery production, but it's all going to come down to that. Will they? Mm, yeah, they're going to. They're going to ramp up the trucks. They're going to ramp up the batteries. They're going to ramp up mining of nickel, to meet the demands for their new battery needs. And uh, with that, I welcome your comments. Let's go ahead and see what everybody else thinks about these predictions. And uh, as always, best of luck with your own systems. And we will see you again soon.